Good morning. Thank you everyone for coming here live in our audience and for everyone that's on the webinar. I appreciate you taking the time this morning to spend an hour with me to discuss food and beverage issues, particularly FDA inspections. My name is Jennifer Nager and I'm chair of the Food and Beverage Law Practice Group here at Reinhardt. The Food and Beverage Law Practice Group is an interdepartmental practice group that helps food and beverage companies from beginning to end. So regulatory issues and recall issues, labeling, packaging, that's what I focus on. But we have people in our department who focus on the contract side, distribution, supply chain, all the way up through IP, trademark, real estate. So we're a one-stop shop for all those issues. Um, this presentation, before, during, and after an FDA inspection, is a part of a series of seminars that, we, that the Food and Beverage Group put on. Um, last year we did some seminars on succession planning. Um, we hope to do, um, as well as the Food Safety Modernization Act and other various topics, we hope to do another one in February on Prop 65. That's a California statute that has affected not just Californians, but companies all over the country and a lot of our clients here in Wisconsin. Um, so we hope, especially food and beverage companies, so we hope to do a seminar on that in, in February, so stay tuned for that. So we will get started. The goal today, when you leave today, is to have a better sense of how to prepare your company for an FDA inspection. What you need to be doing now, what you should be doing during the FDA inspection when it's taking place, and then what to do after the FDA inspection. It's best to prepare now. Don't wait until someone is knocking at your door. Okay, if you have any problems seeing the, um, on the webinar, if you have any problems seeing the slides, uh, please shoot a message to Nancy and she will be sure to fix it. Using the question section of your the Q&A at the end. All right, we'll get started right away. So what allows an FDA inspector to come to your door? What gives them the general authority to inspect your facility? And that would be the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Section 704. So they have the right to come and inspect your facility pursuant to this statute. Importantly, and this is something to remember, that they must inspect your facility within reasonable times and within reasonable limits and in a reasonable manner. So everything needs to be, quote, reasonable. If you hear a knock at your door or if you're at home watching TV on a Sunday night and you get word from your facility that an FDA inspector is there on a Sunday night at 9 o'clock, that is not reasonable. So that's in times when you need to be paying attention to what, quote, reasonable means. If your facility is a 24-hour facility that is running at all times and it's a Monday night, that may be more in lines with what reasonable is. But this is something that you should be discussing with your inspection team beforehand. What is considered reasonable? When can you push back on when an inspector is there and ask them to come back at a time when management is around, when your inspection team is available? Importantly, the frequency of inspections are increasing. All facilities must be inspected within seven years of the enactment of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was enacted in 2011 and then once every five years thereafter. So if your facility has not been inspected since 2011, be ready because they will be knocking at your door very soon. And also it's important that consent is unnecessary. They do not need to ask your permission to come into the facility. You have to give it. You have to allow them in the facility. In fact, if you say no and you tell them that that cannot come in at a reasonable time, so if they come at 10 a.m. on a Monday, then it's considered a prohibited act under the statute, the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act, for you to refuse entry. So you have to permit them to copy records and to come in and inspect your facility if they come at a reasonable time. And if you, if you don't and you refuse consent, then they will just get an inspection warrant and they'll come back. And then they will then be allowed in with the warrant and you will be subject to a prohibited act and you'll possibly be subject to a violation. So let them in if it's a reasonable time. So why does the FDA come and inspect your facility? Under its authority, the FDA can, can conduct various types of inspections, including these five here. They can conduct routine inspections. So under the Food Safety Modernization Act, which we'll call FSMA, 
they conduct routine inspections just to make sure that you are complying with the regulation. It's called a no-cause routine inspection. They can also come for cause, and that's to investigate a particular problem that's come to their attention. It may be a complaint that someone has called in. It may be a complaint by a customer, by a consumer. It may be a complaint by a competitor. Who knows? But that would be a for-cause inspection when the FDA specifically comes in to find, uh, to search or do some investigation on a specific problem. The third reason is pre-approval inspection. So some inspections are conducted to pre-approve a facility to manufacture and distribute certain foods or animal feeds. An example would be pre-approval is required for a medicated feed mill license. So if you have that type of food, if you make that type of food or you run a, a specific facility that would require that, that would be another reason why the FDA would come prior to making any of those products. Compliance is the fourth reason. You had a regular routine inspection and they discovered a problem. So they, you had various back and forth with the FDA and now they've come back to reinspect. They've come back to see if you fixed that problem. You're going to want to make sure that you did at this point because it could result in enforcement action or some more serious penalties. And then the fifth reason is criminal. They're aware of a very intentional or serious egregious problem that is happening in your facility. Those are the ones you do not want to be a part of. It's best to, to be present at, just at routine, the number one cause for inspection. All right, so now we know why the FDA can be at your door. We know that they are allowed, they're allowed permission to enter the facility within a reasonable time and within reasonable limits. It is essential that you do certain things with your company, with your team, with your management before the inspector comes to your door. It is important that you prepare an inspection manual prior to any FDA inspection. You want to have that manual. It can be as simple as an SOP. The standard operating procedure that you have that you pull out, that you can show the inspector um, that these are the various policies that your company has. It's very easy to do if you don't have one. You know, we're happy to help you with that and your regular counsel is happy to help you with that. It's something that you need to have drafted beforehand. It also provides you the opportunity to think about issues before an FDA inspector comes to your door and you have to think on your feet. So what needs to be in this manual? The first is a list of the members of your inspection team. Who is going to be called when the FDA inspector comes to the door? Who is going to escort the FDA inspector around your facility? You're going to want a list of all those members that are going to consult, review the FDA inspector's notes, consult with the FDA inspector after the inspection, and escort the inspector around. You're going to want their contact information, and you're going to want their designee in case that person is not available when the FDA inspector comes out of town, they're traveling, you're going to want their backup. So you're going to have that list of members in your manual. That's going to be page one. The second is your company inspection policy. What is your policy when the inspector comes in? What is your policy on affidavits? Do you allow employees to sign affidavits that the FDA inspector puts in front of you? What is your, what is your policy on photographs? Can the FDA inspector take pictures when they come around your facility? The questioning of employees. Can they ask employees questions as they're touring your, your facility? Can they speak to your employees about various topics? What about trade secret and confidential information and access to company documents? These are all examples of the type of policies that you need to have in your, your manual. And we'll go through these one by one in a bit to, to, to break them down a little bit. But these are all policies that you're going to want to think about with your team and have in your manual as to how your company views these before they come. You're also going to want to have procedures for responding to the arrival of an inspector. What is your receptionist supposed to do or your security guard supposed to do when an FDA inspector comes? You're going to want to have it planned out step by step and included in the manual. Procedures for interacting with the inspector. What are you supposed to do when they ask for a tour of the facility? Who is supposed to go with them? What areas are they allowed to go in? What areas are they allowed to go in? These are all things you need in your manual. A system to document the entire inspection. How do you prepare that FDA, uh, that inspection file? How up to date should you keep it? These are all things that you're going to want to have in your manual. And instructions for resolving issues before and after the inspection. Again, these can be simple as one or two sentences, but they need to be addressed in your manual or your policy. 
And prior to any inspection, not only do you need to have an inspection manual, but you need to make sure that your house is in order. And what do I mean by that? Make sure that all your records are up to date. Make sure you're complying with all your policies and procedures. Make sure that you know where your records are kept. When an FDA inspector comes to your door, they're going to want you to start gathering documents and records right away that they can take with them at the end of the inspection. So if you're fumbling around trying to find these types of documents, that's going to put you in a bad position with the inspector. So know ahead of time where all that information is. In mock inspections, I find it really, really helpful to have your inspection team get together unannounced, um, perform periodic mock FDA inspections. This helps your team ease any tensions that they may have before an actual inspector comes to the door. They're not as nervous because they've done it before. And also, it helps you discover any problems that you may not have been aware of. You think your house is in order. You think you know where everything is. You think you're following everything to the T. But when you conduct a mock inspection, you're seeing that certain things aren't as you expected them to be. So again, it helps ease tensions when that, before the FDA inspector comes. And also, self-audit. I think it's really helpful to prepare a self-inspection checklist so you can investigate areas of potential concern. And this can be areas, you have a checklist, employee training, you have a checklist of pest control, sanitation, equipment maintenance, uh, handling of raw materials, labeling, and you just go through and you check to make sure that you're doing everything the way you're supposed to be doing it. You're following your policies. So while you're doing all of this, and while you are making sure that your house is in order, the inspector who's coming to inspect your facility is doing the same. They don't come to your door without knowing a lot about you as a, your company's background. They know your history. They know your program guidance. They know your registration and your listing information. They know previous inspection uh, issues you may have had. They are aware of all that because before they come to your door. So you should be just as prepared as they are. All right, so importantly, and I don't mean to sound, I don't want to scare you out there, but the primary purpose of an inspection is to find problems with your facility. That's why the FDA inspector is there. They want to make sure that you are complying with all the regulations, and if you're, if you're not, their job is to point that out. Their job is to write that down on their observation checklist and to bring that to their boss's attention. So the purpose of the inspection, it's an adversarial procedure. So while you're not supposed to be argumentative um, with them and, and fight with them, but, it is, but do know that when they're there to come visit your facility, it's to find problems with it. So approach it in that regard. So what do you do when the inspector comes? <clears throat> first things first, treat them as you would any visitor. So train your receptionist or your security guard that when an inspector is, opens the door and it comes into your facility, you would have any visitor, you would have them sign the, the visitor's log. So, and and your, your manual should have a step-by-step -step procedure as to what your receptionist or security guard is to do. Greet the inspector, have them sign the visitor's log, and then take them to a secured location. Have it in your manual, where do you direct the inspector? Where do you have your receptionist direct the inspector? I recommend a conference room or an office that's away from any operational facility, any record keeping areas. Um, if you have a conference room in the front of your facility, I recommend putting them in there and then letting them know that you will get your management, you'll contact your management and the inspection coordinator right away and you'll get the, the inspection started. Importantly, do not ask your receptionist for the inspector's cadet credentials. You can ask them to get a card from the inspector, but don't ask them to see their credentials because that is usually the start of the inspection. And they then can go tour the facility if they choose to. So do not ask for credentials. Limit it to a card only and then put them into a secure location, an isolated place, I should say, so they can't wander the facility unescorted. And then the receptionist is supposed to call your inspection coordinator. Call the person who is going to be following the inspector around the facility. And then that inspection coordinator should notify the inspection team. Call everyone to let them know that someone is in the facility and that you need to treat accordingly. And be on your best behavior. And also, 
Request that your legal counsel remain on call to assist you if there's any areas of concern. If they're asking for something you don't think they're entitled to, or they're pushing back on your company policies that you say, no photography, and they're pushing back on that. It's really important that you have your legal counsel on call so they can help you in tough, in tough times like this. And do not delay. So do not put the inspector in that isolated conference room and then putz around for 20 minutes. That will only antagonize them. So I would make sure your, your receptionist or security guard knows right away to call the inspection coordinator and get the team gathered right away. So the pre-inspection conference. So once your inspection coordinator is aware that the inspector is in the facility, they should go to the isolated conference room where the inspection coordinator is and ask for a pre-inspection conference. Now these aren't required, like the post-inspection conference is required. It's mandatory that the inspector do this. This isn't required, but I'm not aware of any inspector saying, I'm not going to speak with you beforehand, let's get started. So it's a good time. This is when you want to verify their credentials. You want to ask to see their credentials, and you also want to ask for the Form 483. That is the, that's the notice of the inspection. I'm sorry, it's Form 482. That's the notice of inspection. That's, okay, now the inspection is to begin. So you want to ask for those documents, and you also want to ask why are they there? Why are you here? Um, it's not a rude question. You're not going to anger them. You want to know why they're there because you want to determine the scope of the inspection beforehand if possible. And also, you want to start gathering any documentation that you can at the beginning so that it's ready for the inspector at the end of the inspection. So if it's a routine inspection, you can have your people start, you know, start printing or copying your regular records. Or, and also you know what they're going to be looking at. But if they've limited it to, okay, we have an issue with this product line, then you know that the inspection is going to be only limited, the scope is only going to be limited to this product line. And you don't have to gather documents or records pertaining to other products. And, and it's at this point, this pre-inspection conference, and this is really important, that you want to notify the inspector before the inspection, the tour has begun, of your company policies on photography, affidavits, and the like. What you want to sit down, you want to show the inspector your policy and say, before we get started, just so there's not any question, these are the company policies. Let them know beforehand so they're not surprised at when, you start the, when you start the tour. So what are these policies and what should you do? The easiest one, affidavits or statements. This is the very easiest one. And oftentimes, the inspectors are trained to get you to sign affidavits, to get you to sign statements. And it could easily, it could be statements on the easiest thing of shipment date. You know, get them to sign an affidavit saying that this is when they ship certain product. Do not sign any affidavits or statements. That should be, that should be policy number one in your manual. We do not allow any signature, anybody to sign affidavits or statements. And you should not comment on any of these. You should not comment on the nature of the contents and don't make any verbal agreements with them. Just simply say that you will get the proposed affidavit and you will review it with legal counsel, period. Don't say, and then we'll sign it and get it back to you in 10 days because they will hold you to that. So don't sign it, say company policy is I can't sign it, but let me take that the affidavit or that statement and, and review it with legal counsel. So that's the easy one. The second policy you should have is about photography, which I addressed before. Now, again, the FDA takes the position that they have the right to take photos inside your plant. They will come with their, their camera, and they, they think that they have the right to do this. But in reality, there's no express legal authority that allows them to do that. Um, a lot of companies are OK with, people, with uh, inspectors taking pictures. And if that is your policy, that is fine. And I don't have a view one way or the other about photography. Um, and I'll get to a point that is important that you remember, remember if you do allow photography. But it's something that you need to talk with management and you need to talk with your inspection team and have a policy lined up before it happens, before someone comes. And think about if you do object to photography, if you don't want any photography in your plant, I suggest having a sign entrance saying, you know, photography is prohibited at, inside this facility. Have that be the first sign that they see so that when they're reading the manual, it's not new to them. Because objecting to photography may antagonize an inspector because they think they have the right to do this. So you need to weigh that against any risk that you see with any photos of your plants being out in the public. 
So your inspection file, the pictures that you take, the observations that the inspector makes, those are all subject to FOIA requests. So anybody, your competitors, you, um, anybody can t ask a FOIA request for your inspection file. So if you don't make sure that your photography, your pictures of any trade secrets you have are designated as confidential, then that will be made public. So you need to weigh the risk of possibly antagonizing an inspector, making them angry by saying no to pictures, with a lot having possibly having some pictures of your plant out in public. So again, if you say no to pictures, I would have a sign in your entrance that says photography prohibited. If you do allow photos, then you should take a camera with you. So the inspection coordinator or someone else that is following the inspector around should have a camera and should be taking a picture at the exact same angle and the exact same time as that inspector is, as well as from different angles. So you can keep in your inspection file everything that the inspector saw. And it's also really important that if you allow photography that you see that the inspector is taking a picture of something that is confidential or is taking a picture of something that you think is a trade secret, you need to designate it at that time. When they're taking the picture, say, excuse me, please make sure that that is marked as confidential. And also, you know, when you're taking notes, make sure he took a picture of X, Y, and Z, confidential. So that when you have your post-inspection interview, that you say you took a picture of this, it makes sure it's marked confidential so it doesn't get out in the public. So I don't have a particular feeling one way or the other about photography. It's something that you need to decide as a company and the risk that you're willing to, uh, your, the risk you're really, your company is willing to have one way or the other on that. But it should be decided beforehand. Questioning of employees. Again, this is something that inspectors are trained to do. They're trained to, when you're touring the facility, they're trained to speak to uh, employees at, on the line, to speak to employees as they're walking through. How do you feel about that? What do you do in this instance? This is a, a really important area when you need to train your employees before the inspection happens. Let them know what to do so that when an inspector comes up and talks to them, they're not as surprised as you are that they're asking them questions. They should know that, again, there's no express legal authority that they have that allows them to question authorities, to question employees. So this is, again, something you need to decide beforehand. You need to train your employees. Do not volunteer information. Okay? Answer the questions that is asked if you allow your employees to answer questions. And do not speculate outside your area of expertise. If you know something, answer the question and, and don't speak anymore. And then don't joke and don't um, make idle conversation with the inspector. Because again, this is an adversarial proceeding. And the important thing is that non-managerial versus managerial employees, if an inspector asks the manager a question, it could possibly bind the company, as where someone, a lower level employee may not necessarily, necessarily bind the company when they're answering a question. So just be careful and have your policy beforehand and make sure your employees are aware of that policy. So the fourth policy you're going to want to have in your manual is what to do with trade secret and confidential information. And, and I alluded to this before when I was talking about photography, is designate it beforehand. So know what areas of your facility have to deal with confidential information or trade secrets and, and make sure that when the FDA inspector comes around, is taking notes about something, is taking pictures, that you ask them at the time that that information is designated confidential. And what I would recommend doing, uh, and this is an important note, I think, is that once you have an FDA inspection and it's over with, I would make a FOIA request yourself. So you, the four or six weeks have gone by, you've gotten the report, you know, you know there'll be a follow-up or no follow-up, submit a FOIA request for your information. You get the whole file and you can see if there's any pictures in the file, this picture really should be confidential. And then you can contact the, the inspector or your local compliance office and you can make sure that certain information is designated confidential because you don't want it to be out in the public. All right, the fifth policy that you should have in your inspection manual, access to company records. So the company should have a written policy that designates records that the FDA is allowed to see and copy. Certain records they are not allowed to see and copy, and I will show you those in a minute. But right now, what records is the FDA entitled to review? So they have authority, and that authority is limited by the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act, 
as to what records they may inspect. And again, it's in within reasonable limits and in a reasonable manner as to what records they can inspect. And it's records pertaining to the manufacturing, processing, packing, distribution, receipt, holding, and importation of food. And that may seem like just about everything in your facility, but it's not. It is a large amount, but it's not. And there are certain records that you should know that they are not aware of, and we'll get to those in a minute. There's also any records associated with reportable food registry or any reports you've made on that and any notifications. And again, it's paper documents you have. It's electronic databases that you keep information that you may not have, hard copies. They're entitled to go into that database and they're allowed to review that information. Regardless of if you allow certain records to be copied for the FDA inspector, it's important that you make two copies of whatever records are given to the inspector. You want to give them one and you want to retain one for your inspection file. This inspection file needs to be maintained, I would recommend, for up to three years, even longer if there are issues. But you need to have an inspection file so you have an idea as to what the inspector took pictures of, what samples they took, which we'll get to in a minute, but also what records did you give them. So you need to have a copy of everything. And again, if you give them a confidential document, Make sure you have a stamp. Put confidential on it as you're handed to them. Don't just rely on them and say this is confidential. Stamp it confidential and stamp your record confidential as well. Again, the access to the company records you should have in here that the FDA is allowed to copy and review. And I would list these records pertaining to the manufacturing, processing, packing. List the records they're allowed to have so there's no question when it comes time. And I would also list the records that they're not entitled to review. There is no authority to allow the FDA to review your recipes or financial data, pricing data, any personnel files, research data, or sales data other than shipment data regarding a sale. So I would include in your policy that they're not entitled to review this information without a subpoena or court order. And again, if it's something that you need to weigh. If, you, if they're asking for a piece of information that you don't feel particularly strong about giving them, you know, weigh your balance, you know, weigh the risk versus the benefit of getting it out there. But if you do provide them with a hard copy, make sure it's stamped confidential. So again, as with the question of employees, uh, with affidavits, with photography, the FDA inspectors, uh, and they're also called FDA investigators, so they're trained to ask you for information that they're not legally entitled to have with the hopes that you haven't been, you know, you aren't up to speed, you haven't thought about this before, that you'll give the information to them and it'll make their life a lot easier. So know your rights beforehand uh, and review all this information with your team. So make sure that's in the company policy so you don't have to arbitrarily say, so to them it's not an arbitrary statement saying I'm, I'm not going to give you the information. It's in your policy, you just point to it. Say unfortunately I'm not allowed to give that because it's company policy. And again, like I said before, refusal produce may not be the best course of action if there are certain documents you don't feel strongly about, um, giving them one way or the other as long as they're marked confidential. Think about that beforehand because you may antagonize, you may you know, upset them. Um, is it worth it? Sometimes, in some instances, it really may be, and that's fine. Hold your ground, but it's something you need to decide beforehand because there could be risks of producing it, so they could use that data, that document that they're not really entitled to have against you somehow. Again, if you produce it without objecting to it, without pointing to company policy, you may have waived your objection, and at that point, it's too late to walk anything back. So think about it beforehand, no, talk with your legal counsel about it. It can be as simple as a phone call. Am I allowed to, what are your feelings about saying no to this type of document? Yes or no? And that's fine. All right, now that you've had this pre-inspection conference with the FDA inspector, you've gone through all the company's policies and procedures so that when they're touring the facility, they know exactly how you feel about photography. They know exactly how you feel about signing any affidavits afterwards, about questioning your employees. Now they are going to ask you to tour the facility. So you should make sure that your FDA inspector who is up to, up to speed on all these policies is with the inspector at all times. They should go everywhere with them, except maybe on a lunch break or in the restroom, but the coordinator should be everywhere with the inspector. 
And you want to, before you go out there in the pre-inspection conference, you want to make sure the inspector knows that if you make any observations, if you see anything you feel uncomfortable with, inspector, let me know. You know discuss, discuss observations as, as they arise. You know, they are not required to do that, but it's certainly something you should raise beforehand. If you see something, let me know. You know, we may be able to correct it right away, or I may be able to answer your question right away. And if you can answer or fix a problem that they see, do it. In certain instances, you may not be able to do it right away. It's something that you're going to have to talk with management about. You'll have to come to a plan with. But if it's a piece of garbage or something you can pick off the floor or something that you can resolve right away, do it. Don't just walk on by. And of course, while this is an adversarial proceeding, be professional and cooperative with the investigator. Do what they say right away, um, as long as it's within company policy, and don't be argumentative. If they say something that you disagree with, you can address it in a respectful manner, but they have a lot of control of your facility, and, and you will be given the opportunity to dispute things that they say, um, but it, it's best not to make this an argumentative um, time. It, it is adversarial, but be professional and cooperative. And in addition to asking them to discuss any observations that they see as it comes up, ask questions. If, you, if they say something that you disagree with or if you have a comment to something, speak up. Now is the time to do it. Don't wait until they've, they've left and they have made their observations to, to say something. And of course, attempt to limit the scope of any inquiries they have. So if they say, please let me see all of your complaints, make sure you, you say for what time frame. For, a prob for what product? You know, see if you can limit it as much as possible so you're not just opening your record cabinet and giving them absolutely everything. See if you can narrow it because likely, in all cases, they, they want to limit it themselves. And answer, like we said before, answering the inspector's questions, it's common industry practice for, for um, inspection coordinators, for, for employees to answer the questions. But as I said before, don't volunteer any information do not speculate areas that you don't know, and of course, be truthful. This goes back to the policy on questioning employees. So sampling, and this is also something that you should have in your inspection manual. An FDA inspector is entitled to take samples of finished product, unfinished product, packaging materials, ingredients, and of your environment, your facility. The, uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act authorizes them to take these samples. So know your rights with respect to these samples. Know what you're getting yourself into when they take them. It's important, so in addition to the Form 482, which is the Notice of Inspection, that's, okay, the inspection is starting, that you keep and you need in your file. If you see the inspector is taking a sample of something, Ask for Form 484, and that is a receipt. That's a receipt of any samples that they've taken. And you can also put that in your inspection file. And be sure when they are taking the samples, don't be afraid to ask, what, why are you taking that sample? And make sure that you take notes that they're taking, you know, for the reasons why they're taking that sample and the method by which they're taking that sample. And then be sure to make you know, note of the type of containers that they're using for the inspection. All these is, is, notes are going to be helpful should there be any issues with that sample down the line. If it comes back positive for any bacteria or any other issues, path, or pathogen, you're going to want to know how they took that sample and, and you're going to want to have that all that documented. So in addition to making sure you have all that information down and obtaining that 484 receipt, and I should note too that be sure you don't sign receipts. So again, that goes with the affidavit and the statement. They may hand you a receipt and say, okay, here is a copy for me. Can you please sign this? Don't sign any 484 receipts. Just say, again, no, I'll have to review that with, my, with our legal counsel. But we would like a copy for our records. So in addition to taking the notes about how the samples were taken and the containers and all of that, you're going to want to make sure that you take duplicate samples. So take two samples from the same lot and retain them under suitable conditions, the same conditions that, um, that they're being in the, in the facility. And you're also going to record the lot number and the dates of the inspection file. So all of this, so record as much information as you can about that sample and retain it in your inspection file. So if there's any issues down the line and it was positive for any pathogen or any other bacteria, 
that you have note of where the, the lot came, was that the sample came from. And if it's a serious concern, if you have serious issues about a, a sample, a lot where a sample came from, put that lot on hold until the for until it's further you get the receipt, you, you find out if there's any pathogen or any issues with that sample. Put it on hold until further notice. That's going to prevent you a lot of hassle down the line. And also it's important that you ask the FDA for the results. They should provide it to you anyway, but it might just be helpful in the post inspection interview say, you know, please provide us with any results of the, the testing when it comes back. So just to summarize with respect to samples, they are, the FDA inspector is allowed to take samples. They have legal authority to do that. As with a lot of the other things that they try to do, they don't. But with this, they actually do. You want to want to make sure that you ask for the 484 receipt. Do not sign the receipt, but ask for it. Take notes. Why are you taking the sample? What containers? they put the samples in, the methods they took the samples. Obtain two duplicate samples from the same lot that the inspector took the samples from and record the lot number and the date for your inspection file. So one of those samples um, that you reserve and one may be on hold for testing. And then ask the inspector what tests will be performed on the samples and then when you expect the results and let them know you want the results as soon as they get them. And lastly, if there is serious concern, put the lot on hold until you get the sample results. Inspection exit interview. So you've had the pre-inspection interview, you have the tour of the facility. Now the, it's not mandatory, but I strongly encourage you to sit down with the inspection, with the inspector, the FDA inspector, and learn about their observations. Talk with them after the inspection. Specifically, the inspector will meet with management. So the inspection coordinator will be there. You may want to call in upper management. And I would also have, so anybody that participated in the tour. So if the, the inspection coordinator, the person that came along that took photos and made all the notes, they should all be in the, in the exit interview as well. And at this point, you're going to want to talk about all the observations that the FDA inspector made at the tour. So a part of the inspection exit interview, the inspector will present a Form 483. So that's the inspectional observations. It's provided to top management before the completion of the inspection. Written notice of significant objectional matters observed during the inspection. If you do not receive a 483, good news. That means there are no objectional issues. Nothing was observed that you need to be concerned about. That's the goal, not to receive one of those. If you have, no big deal. You, know, you, can, you will definitely respond to it. Um, and in a lot of instances, people receive a 483, but those can all be addressed. So it's at this time you want to present any issues you had. Do you disagree with any of the observations that the inspector made? Importantly here, the inspectors are trained to observe. Okay, their job is to go around and write down their observations. They do not make conclusions on whether there was a violation. So this inspector just observes. They do not make conclusions. That goes to compliance officer to make conclusions based on their observations. But you do want to make sure that the observations they have listed in the 43 are correct. So if you disagree with them, now is the chance to address it. So management should talk to them. The inspection coordinator who went on the tour should address it at this exit interview. You know, I noticed that you made this observation. I fixed it. Can you make a note in here that I corrected it immediately? And they should do that. I disagree with you about something you wrote here. Now is the time to say it. They may keep it on their, you know, the 483 form, but it's important that you address it. And so you can note, too, can you please make a note that I disagreed with you about that? Now, the observations of lesser significance won't be included on the 483, but will likely be discussed at the interview this post-inspection uh, uh, interview, and then will be later included in the in establishment inspection report. So the Form 483 will form the basis of the inspection report that the inspector will provide you four to six weeks later. So again, each observation should be addressed in this interview. Have the inspector go one by one with you. Now is the time to do it. Don't wait till they leave to, to say, oops, I should have said something about that. 
And importantly, as with the pre-inspection interview, in the post-inspection interview, don't make impromptu commitments. Don't say something like, oh, I can fix that in 10 days and we'll get back to you because the FDA inspector will be at your door in 10 days saying you said you'd fix that. So make sure you don't make any impromptu commitments. Make sure you know it with the inspector whether you agree or disagree about, actually don't say you agree with them, but if you disagree with them about something, make sure you state it in this and go through each observation and then we'll talk in a minute about getting your inspection team together and how to address each of the observations made in this form 483. Now, a response is not required to the 483, but it is strongly recommended, strongly as in bold italics, strongly recommended that you do it. Because, and, and I say in 15 days because that's the timeline that the FDA is set to issue warning letters. So you have an inspection, they saw something of big concern that they made in their 483, the 483, the form 43. If that's not responded to in 15 days, it can often go to the compliance office and they may issue a warning letter. But if they have a response to that, they may think twice about it. They may think, oh, we're, they're correcting that. They're doing something about that. A warning letter is not issued, is not necessary. So in your response, again, in, in a response like this, you're going to want to have legal counsel vet it before you send it because you don't want to be making any admissions in here. You don't want to be saying anything in here that you're going to regret later. It's just you want to make sure that you address areas that you disagree with in the 483 and then how are you going to correct that. How do you plan to fix it? That's what they want to see. Importantly, it should not go unanswered. Post-inspection meeting of the inspection team. So the inspector has left the facility. So make sure the when the inspector has left the facility, and in some instances they may come back because they weren't able to collect all the documents that they needed, they weren't able to finish the tour of the facility, um, so in, in, one, in, in some instances it may not complete in one day, and that's fine, but in the instances where they have, make sure before the inspector leaves you get your Form 42, your Form 483 if it's necessary, if not, that's a great job, you've done everything right, um, and your Form 484, that's your receipt of any of your samples. So all of that should be in your inspection file. So when your team meets afterwards, you have all of these documents, you have all of your notes, you have any pictures that were taken, you have all, everything that you need in your inspection file. So you can review all of these notes with your team to see how you can fix any issues that they have. It's really important and any, all responsible companies need to have a post-inspection meeting because that is the only way to make sure that there's proper closure here and that there will be optimal resolution for any issues. So compile your inspection file, prepare a report for management if management wasn't present at the time wasn't aware of what, what happened at the inspection, make sure you review your Form 43 and think about how you're going to fix it. And it's at this point that you want to get counsel on the phone. You can take the first draft at your Form 43, let counsel know that you're going to submit it to them and that you need them to review it before it goes out. Establishment inspection report. This is something we addressed, I addressed briefly um, earlier. So the Form 483 and everything that we talked about, the sampling, the tours, the pictures, that is all going to form the basis of the inspector's establishment inspection report. So this is going to come to you four to six weeks after the inspection. This is also going to be subject to a FOIA request. Anybody who wants this information can get it. So make sure it's after you receive this report that you make your FOIA request because as part of this inspection report will be all the sample results, will be all the records that they received, will be all the pictures they took, will be any exhibits. All of that information will be a part of this inspection report. So after you receive this, you're going to want to make a FOIA request to make sure that everything is stamped confidential that you think will need to be confidential because that information will be left out from the FOIA request and anybody who makes that request won't get that information. So this inspection report is prepared by the inspector and it's going to contain everything in great detail. So the Forum 43 will only uh, address any objectionable issues that they saw. This, for, this uh, EIR is how I refer to it. It will include everything, a detailed description of the entire inspection. And what must be included in this, as I say here, is must identify any conditions or practices 
where the food consists of filthy, putrid, or decomposed substance, or has been prepared, packed, or held in unsanitary conditions, whereby it may be contaminated with filth rendered injurious to health. So if you see something like that in your inspection report, you're going to want to respond. It will include, so like I said before, it's going to include all your sample results, pictures, all of that with it. And in sum, it's the narrative document depicting the inspector's objective and subjective impressions of the inspection. So what do you do when you get it? Oh, this is a lot of information. What do I do? Well, you've already had your post-inspection meeting with your team, so, and you've already answered any 43 forms that you've gotten at this point. So you're very familiar with it, with any issues that may have arisen, but you're going to want to review the EIR for any errors and you're going to want to respond in writing to any inaccuracies, just as you would to the 483. And I, at this point, again, before you submit anything in writing, I would let legal counsel review that. Let them see. So make sure that the manner and tone of your response is appropriate. So what happens next? You have your Form 483, your EIR, any responses that you've submitted to all those documents. That packet is forwarded to the compliance officer at the district office. And that compliance officer is the one who makes conclusions. So they will decide either one of three things. One, that no further action is warranted, which is in most cases what happens. You've responded. You've corrected everything. Um, any issues that may have come up, you've taken care of. So nothing else is needed there. They may order, two, a reinspection to ensure that any promised corrective action has been completed and that problems have been rectified. So if there was a serious issue that they've identified in a 483, they may have a reinspection before they check you off as complete. Or further, they may, the compliance officer may recommend further regulatory action or legal action depending on the seriousness of the violation and your regulatory history. So FDA enforcement options. What is the compliance officer entitled to do? If they decide that further enforcement options or further regulatory action is needed, they may issue a warning letter. And these are used for violations that may lead to an enforcement action if they're not corrected promptly. So you got your 483, you didn't respond in time, or you didn't provide an appropriate response, and, appropriate, and you didn't correct the problem as they would have hoped. That's when you may get a warning letter. Uh, and again, if something that may lead to enforcement action is what you do not want to happen, an enforcement action. So if you get a warning letter, again, you're going to want to follow up right away with legal counsel and they're going to want to work with you to figure it out. And you must provide a formal response to this. The warning letter will actually say you need to respond to it within X number of days. So you want to comment on each observation and you're going to want to say what you're going to do again to fix it. In most instances, it's because people don't respond to the 483. That's when they're issued a warning letter. And do not admit you violate anything. Just identify in there any areas you disagree with and how you're going to fix it. That's the most important thing. And you may receive an untitled letter. So it's called a warning letter. It's for more serious violations that may lead to an enforcement action. And an untitled letter are minor violations that won't, necessarily, that won't include, if you don't fix this, you may result in an enforcement action. Unfortunately, under the warning letter, you are gonna, your company is going to face steep reinspection fees. So your company, if you don't respond to the 483, your company is going to be responsible for the inspection fees. And it can go upwards of $20,000. So that's why it's really important that not only you, this is all public information, so consumers can see this information, but you have to pay the cost of reinspection. So, in addition to the warning letter, actions for injunction. And I'll go quickly here because we're running out of time. But an injunction is a case, um, a classic case involves a bad inspection followed by a warning letter. And then you said you're going to fix the problem. The inspector came back. And then you had a bad reinspection. So it usually requires the company to close the facility until the FDA is ensured compliance, until they make sure that any problems have been resolved. You do not want this to happen because it is significant fees for the reinspection, and you've lost all your profits through closing your inspection, closing your facility. So, you know, obviously this is all important, so you're aware of the ramifications that you could have for a bad inspection and then not following up on that, but it's really rare. 
So 20,000 inspections annually lead to 200 warning letters, which lead to about 10 injunctions. So it's very rare, but it does happen. Administrative detention is also uh, something that could happen. The FDA will seize your product for up to 30 days until they are sure that you, you know, there's no pathogens in the product or they're sure that you have made any corrective action that is necessary. And of course, criminal prosecution. And, and if the injunction is rare, this is even rarer. Um, it's when a company has demonstrated an unwillingness to correct a violation uh, or when the violation is flagrant, intentionally committed, or involves a health hazard the company did not try to prevent. And the example that everyone's heard of is PCA, the Peanut Corporation of America, where you know, many, many people died because of the egregious acts of the owners of the company. They knew their product was contaminated. They have evidence of them saying, I can't lose money here. I know that this product is contaminated. Ship it anyway. So that's the kind of instance that's going to result in criminal prosecution. But importantly, it's not always you know, the smoking gun email that says you have the intent here. Um, the Jensen Farms, the cantaloupe um, people who a couple people died because of the contaminated cantaloupe, they, there, was no, there was no smoking gun. Um, there was no email that they were, the government was not able to prove that the owners of Jensen Farms intentionally committed any malfeasance here, that they intentionally shipped uh, contaminated cantaloupe. It was solely based on the fact that they could have prevented it. So there was no evidence that they intentionally committed any misconduct, but they were held criminally liable, had a misdemeanor, six months house arrest, and a large fine, even though there was no intention. And the same with quality egg. Hopefully we'll never get to any of that. Like I said, that's even rarer than the 10 injunctions annually, but it's something to be aware of. So in sum, what do we learn here from all of this? It's a lot of information. Um, feel free to shoot me uh, any emails with any questions. And I have some questions here that I'll answer. Um, and the audience may have some questions. But it's a lot of information. And it, what we've done before is we've taken uh, companies' inspection manuals. And it's a few hours to correct them, to add any holes that they are missing. Um, if you've done something already, it's very easy for legal counsel to look at it and to fix it. Um, if you haven't done something, get started. Get started right away, and then we can also help you fill in any gaps. So, so where do we lose, leave things right now? Involve the entire organization in your inspection plan. So each employee understands what to inspect, what to un expect when there is an inspection. And go back to basics. Make sure you have strong foundational elements of food safety in place. Inspectors today focus on sanitation, allergen control, GMP compliance, and make sure you look at reoccurring problems that you have and understand the root cause and don't just treat the symptom. Look ahead to FSMA. A lot of, some of them are now already enacted. Some of them are now taking place. So make sure that you are comp in compliance. Preventative controls, supplier verification, food defense plans, make sure you're compliance now. Keep good records. If it's not written down, it doesn't exist. So be sure your records are complete, well organized, and accessible. If it's not documented, it, doesn't, it didn't happen. Train, train, train. That goes back to making sure you complete refreshers on food safety practices and how to manage an FDA inspection. Update your inspection manual. And prepare for the FDA inspections. Conduct those mock inspections. Have policies on photography and all the issues we discussed. Nurture your FDA relationship. So build relationship with your local FDA district office. So if you have inspectors come frequently, make it, have a relationship with them. Call them. Call the facility if you have any questions. Stay vigilant. Even companies with strong compliance programs run into problems, and the FDA understands this. So just recognize the problem and correct it right away, and, and document the corrections you're going to take and submit it to the FDA. So uh, does anyone in the audience have any questions? Of course, if you have any questions, do you think of any questions later, feel free to ask. We do have one question from the webinar um, audience. Uh, our facility is open to the public or at least certain areas are open to the public. Can the inspector come and walk around to the open in public areas without telling us? Or they need to tell us immediately when they're there? And that's an excellent question. Um, they are able to walk around. So a lot of people have um, sort of a, a shop, like a, a, you know, in their front area before you walk into the facility. 
they can walk around that shop. They're entitled to do that. They don't have to immediately go straight to, you know, the receptionist and say, I'm the inspector. You know, they're definitely allowed to walk around that shop or any open areas that they have. Um, they will, be, in fact, I would do that if I was an inspector. That's the best way to see, you know, what's happening in your area without someone being aware that you're actually there. That's when you're on your best behavior. So they're absolutely allowed to do that. Um, if, if they want to see any of your production, obviously they're going to have to, to speak to you, but they are allowed to walk around. They don't need to tell you right away. See, uh, another question. I have asked the FDA. I have asked the FDA to not include customer names in the audience. Past ones have honored this. Current one put them in. He said they would redact those names if the audit was released to the public. Can we trust this? No. Um, uh, so unfortunately, not. Um, that's why you want to have an an a FOIA request yourself. Once the the EIR is you've received that. Put your FOIA request in so you are aware of everything that's going to the people that are requesting this information. And then if you get something like this in it or a picture that should be, have been kept out, you can follow up with them. And lastly, how should we respond if the FDA inspector refuses to sign our visitor log and G, uh, GMP acknowledgement log? We have had this happen each time we've had an FDA inspection. I mean, there's nothing you can do. They're technically supposed to do it, and they should. They, that's something so small that they should not be refusing it. I would definitely push for them to do that. And if they refuse, make a note of it, and that can be you know, something that you address in a response if there's any 483 issues. That, to me, would be a sign of an antagonistic inspector, someone who's really there to um, cause trouble. So make a note of that, and that can be in something in your response if they even refuse to sign the inspection log. Well, that's all the questions I have. Um, I want to thank everyone who is online. One Sorry, one more question. Uh, I'm, why don't you say it to me in pieces so that I can say it to the audience? Okay, I'm sorry. If the business owner is able to provide digital records, if the business owner is able to provide digital records of routine and documented food safety inspections, would the FDA look favorably? Would the, on F this would the FDA look favorably on this process? Yes, I mean, if you if you can provide electronic documents versus hard copy, if that's the question, absolutely. I mean, that's perfectly fine. You don't. There's no requirement that you submit them a certain way. You know, you can email records. You can send them send them electronically. I think they would prefer electronic. That way, they're not fumbling around with a lot of hard copy. Um, it's definitely something that they would they would favor. Excellent. Well, if you have any questions, please shoot me an email. You have my contact information. I appreciate your time this morning.